I've been called the N-word to my face. It's not unusual for, for people to want to touch my hair at work. We're guilty until we're proven innocent because of the color of our skin. It's a reality many people live with day in and day out. Racism in our society is an undeniable problem we must face. A stark reminder of how far we have left to go came this summer when outrage over the death of George Floyd sparked global protests. And in August, after a summer of demonstrations demanding an end to police brutality and racial inequality, the San Antonio City Council declared racism a public health crisis. It's a public health crisis because we know that racism has an impact on individual health. Where racism exists, health inequities exist. Right now, we're experiencing history. We are, being, we are a part of history because just the fact that um, we have our city recognizing that racism is a problem, that's a big deal. But some argue the city's declaration doesn't go far enough. The color of your skin is going to di dictate everything. This episode of Case That Explains looks at how racism has shaped health outcomes, how the city plans to address this issue, and what exactly does it mean to treat racism as a public health crisis. Case That Explains. Case That Explains. Case That Explains. Case That Explains. On demand, in-depth perspective. Perspective on stories we bring you in our newscast throughout the day. We're looking into concerns over voting safety during a pandemic and the battle over mail-in voting. A look at how the protests and demonstrations have played out in our city and an examination of what it means to be black in San Antonio. An issue that you have likely felt the effects of, rising property taxes. The roots of Tejano run deep in South Texas. We examine the cultural impact the music has had in San Antonio. In August, San Antonio City Council members passed a resolution declaring racism is a public health crisis. What does this declaration mean and what comes next? Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. I'm Myra Arthur. Although much of this year has been dominated by the novel coronavirus, there is another huge story that is happening across this country. One that some would argue is a different kind of public health crisis. Since this summer, communities nationwide have been dealing with a racial reckoning, grappling with how to try to heal old wounds and move forward in the right way. Before we explain the city of San Antonio's declaration, we want you to hear some personal stories. I sat down with three people from San Antonio who were brave enough to share their experiences with racism. My name is uh, Glow Armor. I work for a corporation where I write contracts for a medical supply company. And at night, I host um, poetry events, uh, different types of events. So event planning and promotion is my nighttime gig. My name is Farrell Clark, and I'm a personal chef as well as a community activist and advocate here in San Antonio. My name is Jolene Garcia. I also go by Josie. I'm retired Air Force, mother of uh, eight, <laughs> to include two special needs children, and I'm a community activist and advocate. Have you ever been a victim of racism? Yes. If I disagreed in a meeting, I was considered a being aggressive or being intimidating, not being able to be myself for the fear of being seen as the angry black woman. Walking down the street and seeing somebody clutch their purse a little bit tighter, or you're in the store and you see somebody, they look at you and make eye contact and they instantly grab their kids and pull them closer as if you're some type of predator that would wish to do them harm. It's not unusual for, for people to want to touch my hair at work. Why do you want to touch my hair at work? And I will tell you that um, as a biracial child, um, my father is Afro-Latino. Um, for all intents and purposes, he, he presents as a black man. And my mother's blonde hair, blue eyed. And I experienced racism within my own family. I've been called the N-word to my face. Garcia, your family, all your, your father, everybody has to have been to jail, right? Because that's what you Mexicans do. Again, I'm Puerto Rican. Because we're talking about it, I think that things are changing. It's slow, but we didn't get here overnight either. I feel like before the, the, um, what we've done was we made some progress and we stopped pushing. And that's what led us to where we are now. Does something feel different this time? Because we have seen protests before. We have seen people 
create nonprofits with the best of intentions in mind, advocate for young people in their communities. Um, the need or the want to do better has been there, as you all were saying, for decades. So does this feel different this time around? It's definitely different. It's, there's no way about it. The pulse of the street, the, the feeling is just different because I believe that we're at a point, and I think it is a culmination of everything that happened. COVID, George Floyd, all these perfect things brewing at the same time have really woken people up. And I truly believe that we're at a time where we realize that it's now or never. And then the fact that it's 2020 and we're just done. Yes. We're just done. Yeah. We need to help people understand that it's not a you against me. It's not a us against them. What it is, is is a human issue. This is a quality of life issue. Well, what is the quote that um, when you're used to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And so I feel that that's what we're bumping up against. People really do feel like there are winners and losers. And that for us to do better, somebody else has to suffer. And we're trying to let everybody know that we don't want what you have. I just want what's for me. And I want you not to block that. Do you believe racism is a public health crisis? Yes, definitely. most definitely. Why? People of color are higher likely to be suffering from diabetes. Their, higher, um, their infant mortality rate is more than double that of white people. Um, maternal. Mater their maternal, maternal mortality rate. Yeah. Mater maternal mortality rate. And I'll even add to that that in our work as community advocates, we've come across um, different opportunities to distribute food to families who are suffering from the effects of COVID. Um, our focus is on the east side right now. Mm -hmm. And we were in need of a refrigerator truck and a forklift to help us um, get boxes of food that we will be giving away for free. And one thing that we noticed is once we mentioned that this food was going to the east side, our calls wouldn't get answered. It would be, oh no, we, we don't offer that service. Um, and we've experienced different when we were going to the west side. So the city has now passed this resolution declaring racism a public health crisis in San Antonio. What was your individual reactions to that? I was very happy that it got done because I think anybody will tell you the first step to fixing a problem is admitting that, that the there problem is one. exists. Yeah. But then I was like, ah, I'm a numbers girl. I'm a details. I write contracts. So I want steps. I want real tangible things. What can I see in six months? What can I see in a year? What can I see five years from now? What are the um, policies and what are the procedures that are going to be rolled out to help address that? How are we going to help build equity in the communities and we know that it's not an overnight process but let's see what the plan looks like what, what is step the plan one. what is step one my fear is that this is going to be a shelf document mm -hmm. this is going to be a document that happened and now what on august 20th the city of san antonio passed that resolution declaring racism a public health crisis and there have been a lot of questions since but let's start here what does that mean and is San Antonio alone in this approach? This is not a San Antonio problem alone. This is a nationwide problem. And where racism exists, health inequities exist. Dr. Lissa Ochoa has been a vascular surgeon in San Antonio for nearly a decade. But from the beginning, she says she noticed something alarming. And I was taking care of private practice, south side patients. I also took call on the north side. I began to see that the demographics were different, the access to health care was different, and the outcomes were different. Ochoa noticed she was treating end-stage diabetic complications in younger, primarily Latino patients on the south side. The north side patients who experienced these same complications tended to be older. I was seeing amputations, heart attacks, strokes, in a population that's younger than me. Ochoa decided to open up her own practice to provide care to those on the south side who need it most. But what she described is not an anomaly. More and more research is showing that race and health outcomes are related. Because we know that racism has an impact on individual health for certain, and then when you take that collectively, it's, it's public health. Black women are four times more likely to die of pregnancy complications than white women. Latino children have a 50% chance of developing diabetes. The average life expectancy of black Americans is four years lower than the rest of the U.S. population. 
These are just a few of the stats that have prompted cities around the country to declare racism a public health crisis. I, I think people need to understand that when we talk about racism, we're talking about um, those different categories, health, housing, and uh, human services uh, types of things that, um, that, are, that people of color, particularly black people, have been discriminated against. Cities and counties in at least 26 states have declared racism a public health crisis. San Antonio is one of three Texas cities or counties that made that declaration this summer. But not everyone is on board. Just take a look at these results from a Fairfax KSAT San Antonio report poll conducted in September. 46% of those surveyed agreed that racism should be considered a public health crisis in Bear County. 49% disagree. And a big indicator of whether someone agrees with the premise that racism is a public health crisis depended on political party affiliation and where a person lives. And so precincts one through one, two and four about roughly 50% of the community feels that racism is a public health crisis. I think it was around 52 to 54%. But in Precinct 3 alone, 60% of those folks in Precinct 3 feel like this is not an issue. You can see how the data reflects where people live and what type of person lives in those areas. And the city of San Antonio pointed to some of that data they've collected that demonstrates that people of color experience worse outcomes in many metrics, including education, health, and housing. When it comes to education, nearly 26% of Latinos and nearly 10% of black residents have less than a high school education. That's compared to 4.8% of white people. And 24% of Latinos and nearly 18% of black people reported putting off health care because of costs. Meanwhile, the rate of low birth weights among black San Antonians is 14.6%, significantly higher than that of Latinos or whites. So what is the problem that's leading to these disparate outcomes? And it's more than just, well, they just don't like to eat healthy or exercise. It's a bigger uh, problem than that. There are the obvious problems, like a lack of access to health care and insurance. And there are systemic issues at play as well. Not being able to get healthy foods easily, not having a safe outdoor space to get exercise, and lacking access to transportation. Ochoa believes a first and major step in righting these wrongs is naming the problem. I, I believe acknowledging that racism has played a role in these healthcare outcomes is definitely the first step. How can you fix a problem if you don't acknowledge it at first? And she believes addressing the problem will ultimately be good for the entire city. If we prevent amputations, heart attacks, people on dialysis, well, these are going to be people in our community who now can go to work, can have a job, can be contributing members of society. The city in the entirety of the community is going to benefit from that uh, from that person, from that patient that now contributes back to a community. A part of acknowledging that racism has played a role in these disparate health outcomes requires taking a look back to identify the root of some of these structural issues. RJ Marquez goes back about 90 years to explain the federal government's role in denying resources to certain communities. In the 1930s, the federal government warned bankers, mortgage lenders, and business owners about neighborhoods in cities across the country, including San Antonio's inner east, west, and south sides. These parts of the city were labeled by the now defunct homeowners loan corporation as definitely declining or hazardous. It's a practice that today is called redlining, and it meant that people living in those neighborhoods, mostly black and Latino residents, didn't have access to regular home loans. And for those wanting a change of circumstances, it wasn't as simple as moving to the next zip code. Many San Antonio neighborhoods that developed outside the inner city were deed restricted, prohibiting people of color from moving into them. People got trapped as a result of it through schools, through location of resources, through allocation of resources. They were forced to work through loan sharks. They were paying extraordinary high rates. Redlining intensified racial segregation and poverty in San Antonio. And that has a psychological effect. That investment did not come to those communities very easily. And so if you're having to travel to get to stores and groceries and places like that, that's going to have an effect on your health. 
redlining created a cycle that generations of San Antonio families have had a difficult time getting out of. To this day, median incomes in the west, south, and right here on the east side are much lower than the north side or areas outside Loop 410. And it's not just financial. Many health issues like diabetes run rampant in these areas. And it was an eye-opener for me when I saw a map of red line San Antonio in the 1930s and correlate it to today's diabetic amputation rates. And it was when it became an eye-opening for me that when racism and segregation was intended back in the early 1900s, that it still had an effect today. Saying that race is a public health crisis, that should not be a controversial issue. And I encourage those people who are uncomfortable with that, um, that it's not just race. You know, race is one of those issues, but class is an issue as well. The practice of redlining ended in the late 1960s, but it left psychological, emotional, and financial scars. It's part of the reason why San Antonio is still one of the most economically segregated cities in the U.S. Many people lost out on decades of generational wealth and well-being that could have made an impact today. You can't just have a law passed today and change 50 to 60 to 70 years of racism or, or class biases. So. Um, I think that's how San Antonio has gotten here. Each generation adds to the next. And so if we don't find a way to address it psychologically, emotionally, citywide, um, we're not gonna really make any kind of change that's really productive. When we hear racism today, we think, are we racist today or are we not? And the bigger picture is that we all can admit that racist activities happened in our past. And it's acknowledging is that racist activities have put policies and it, lack of infrastructure in communities down a path where we see these health inequities. And it's acknowledging that that racist history and activities back then influence and affect us today. Since the city's resolution in August, a citywide action plan hasn't been presented. So where do we go from here? We asked city officials about that. They told us they've been working to create an equitable city since long before this declaration. It might be words on paper right now, but it definitely has a passion behind it that I believe our city can actually make a really big impact when it comes to addressing this other public health crisis that is going on in our community. Dr. Sandra Guetta with Metro Health says the declaration is a first step. So let's take a look at the commitments in that resolution. The city will update the community twice a year about policies and programs that improve racial equity. It also commits to engaging historically marginalized communities in the development of equitable health policies. District 2 Councilwoman Jada Andrew Sullivan was one of many who helped draft that resolution. Working on all of our policies that truly implement an equitable share um, to truly tackle the division that we have um, within the city of San Antonio. But critics argue the resolution doesn't specify any immediate changes or allocate money for this specific movement. We have these resolutions with no teeth, with no, with no grit to them and that's where my criticism comes from. We need to see action from that. Declaring it a public health crisis was just a band-aid, you know, the same way that, you know, taking a knee and raising a fist, if you're not doing anything behind it, those are just symbols. And we really need actions behind it because people's lives are at, are at stake. This issue is a, is a foundational uh, resolution that guides our next steps in terms of policymaking to address historic disparities. We've already started mm -hmm. taking steps within the city of San Antonio prior to even this declaration. One of those steps, the city says, is looking at budgets through an equity lens. Each department must use what's called a budget equity tool when working on their proposed budget. It includes a set of questions to guide departments in assessing how their budget requests benefit or burden communities of color and low income communities. What are the areas that we have to improve to serve to better serve the marginalized communities? Where are we going to spend the money? Metro Health says staff goes through equity training to ensure those types of questions can be answered. We do adequate training of our staff in order to look at 
any sort of bias that may be in our own policies. The city's annual equity report says 4,000 city employees took equity training in 2019. Last year, the Office of Equity chose eight city departments to do their own equity assessments. Once they have those results, those departments will then create a two-year equity action plan. By 2024, those departments are expected to have this assessment process complete. As the resolution draws skepticism from some, Metro Health says people should hold them and the city accountable. We said that we were going to do something about it, right? So we better do it. Even when there is an action plan put forward, there's still the concern that some may be left behind. KSAT producer Alexander McLeod explains even those who agree that racism is a public health crisis hope that that resolution doesn't reinforce negative stereotypes. It's a zoomed out perspective. Declare it a public health crisis, yes. Make an action plan, yes. But in the process, don't narrow your view of whom racism affects. We have to be very careful in how we approach it so that we don't end up creating a double whammy, in a sense, on the communities that we're trying to help through this declaration. Carrie Lattimore is an associate professor of history at Trinity University. He believes declaring racism a health crisis in San Antonio is a great way to acknowledge an issue affecting so many in our community, but worries some of the potential change to come may exclude some of the people it's meant to benefit. We may start to continue trends that really only look at the negative things in the African American community. The city's resolution recognizes persistent health inequities stem from issues like income level and redlining and hopefully a future action plan will seek to address this. But what about the other 77%? I worry that when we discuss these issues, that we leave out um, that racism is affecting all African Americans, not just the poor African Americans. Sometimes we forget that, that the majority of African Americans are middle class. A fact echoed by DeMonte Alexander. This doesn't just affect, you know, um, the, the black folks who live in poverty or don't have access and those types of things it affects all of us everyone from top to bottom uh, racism doesn't care how much you know how much money you make through his work for bare facts alexander has seen how our community has gauged the issue of racism as it applies to policing voting and covid 19 to name a few but it's as a citizen a resident of san antonio alexander says he's been directly impacted i used to run in my neighborhood you know, I used, to, I used to run every morning in my neighborhood to get a workout. I would usually do it right before the sun rises. It's still cool outside. But after um, we see all of these shootings of unarmed black men just running in your neighborhood, um, I stopped doing that because I, look, I don't want to be another statistic because of the color of my skin with a hoodie on jogging, trying to get exercise. Lattimore attributes this line of thought to a long history of stereotyping. Don't look at the stereotypes, um, because the stereotypes of the African-American community are almost always wrong. That's why they're stereotypes. Um, look at the wholeness of it, um, and that may take some time, because that's not always presented as much as it should be. And while the end goal is to achieve equity, in part by addressing the systems which have failed people of color, Lattimore cautions against mistaking people as the problem. When we start to look at people, as the problem or African-Americans as a problem community that has tremendous impacts on the people from that community. Impacts, if history tells us anything, could mean the difference between life and death. It's not a quick fix. Um, these are gonna be things that are gonna have to be addressed over a long period of time. And as Lattimore advises, acknowledge and care for communities in need, yes. Address policies and practices which perpetuate racial inequity, yes but keep an eye on the broader picture. And I think that if we only look at it from a narrow frame, um, we're not gonna really address the issue. Thanks for joining us for this episode of KSAT Explains. We'll see you next week.